time for the Locked on the Gamecocks podcast with Keith Alsa and J.C. Sherbert. Welcome in to episode three of the Locked on the Gamecocks podcast. I am J.C. Sherbert here in studio and joined as always by my good friend Keith Alsep, who's holding it down on the West Coast tonight as we knock out a third edition here on the eve, uh, or I guess by the time this gets produced, it'll be the morning of the start of preseason camp for South Carolina in 2016. Keith, how's it going, buddy? Going great, J.C. Uh, really excited for fall camp to get underway. Looking forward to the official uh, start of the Will Muschamp era. I'm very encouraged and very excited by his press conference today and what he had to say. And uh, again, good news for the Gamecocks, as we talked about last week. Four-star offensive tackle. T.J. Moore uh, making a big commitment to the Gamecocks for their offensive line class, joining his teammate Eric Douglas. And uh, so that was really good news for the Gamecocks, uh, considering Tennessee got the last shot. Absolutely, and I have some thoughts on that for later. But let's start with the press conference today. Um, You know, a couple of things stood out to me. You know, first and foremost, it looks like South Carolina is going to make a – uh, sort of have a different plan on special teams. And I, I'm not talking about the kickers like Elliot Fry and Sean Kelly. I think those guys are, you know, pretty much uh, the guys at kicker and, and punter. Uh, I think Joseph Charlton, they would like for him, as much champ said today, to win the kickoff job. You know, the returners aren't going to be that different. I think Rashad Fenton's obviously a no-brainer, uh, as is A.J. Turner at some of those spots. Uh, but one thing stood out to me that he said today, he's going to put his best players on special teams. He said it's a third of the game. If you don't want to play special teams, you're selfish, and we don't really want you to play. Um, what did you make of that? Because that, that's, a, that's a starkly different yeah. type of philosophy than Steve Spurrier had during his time at South Carolina. Well, J.C., I thought it was music to my ears. Um, special teams is one-third of the game. Uh, as we all know, the – national championship game was clearly decided by special teams. I was about to say that. Um, Not since the Lou Holtz era have we seen a lot of starters on special teams. And I remember Derek Watson blocking two punts in the swamp um, for the Gamecocks. And with Holtz, he did believe in putting starters on special teams. That's kind of an old school mentality, and I like it. I think um, it's been lacking. I can remember, you know, watching the Gamecocks give up big kickoff return after big kickoff return after big kickoff return, even during the 11 win seasons. And, you know, looking at the sidelines and there was, you know, all the starters were over on the sidelines and it was a lot of walk-ons and backups on special teams. So I think it's a fresh approach. I think, you know, players need to get excited about special teams and there's just one more, one more reason, you know, to really be excited about the, the dawn of the Will Muschamp era. I I think this team too, you look at it, you know, they, they don't know who, most of their starters are going to be at the skill positions at quarterback. Uh, running back is kind of a mystery as well. Uh, you know, you're thin in the secondary. You know, you almost have to put a lot of emphasis on special teams, don't you, especially this year, just because that could turn into something that is a tremendous advantage. Because you do have strong kickers. You know, a strong kicker and a strong punter, those guys could contend for all SEC honors. So if you shore up the coverage teams and the return teams – and you can make some things happen there. Um, you know, you can. You, it can help you win football games. I think Will Muschamp realizes that because you, you look at uh, two games during his final year at Florida. Uh, one was against Missouri where they only gave up 70-something yards of total offense. 
But they didn't have field position the whole night. Missouri went on 10, 15-yard drives because the offense kept turning it over and they gave up kick returns. And, and Missouri won that game 42-13 to 13 with only 79 yards of total offense. And then, of course, the South Carolina game uh, where they had the game won and then a blocked field goal and a blocked punt, you know, allowed the game guys to get back in it, send it to overtime and win the game. So, you know, everybody always asks Will Muschamp, and they ask him a million times, you know, per press conference it seems, what he learned at Florida, you know, that seems to be something. And I don't know exactly what their personnel philosophy was at Florida. I do know that that roster was a lot deeper than South Carolina's is right now. And so they probably had some pretty talented guys on special teams there. But to come out and say it about this team, I think, uh, kind of reinforces another notion that, that Muschamp gets it, that he's learned from his experiences, uh, and, and that he's going to try to put a plan in place to win some ball games this year. I agree, and I think what you're seeing here is a little bit of a Mac Brown influence on Will Muschamp. Mac Brown, when he was head football coach at North Carolina and at Texas, was known for great special teams. And let's face it, there's no great teams in special teams unless it's an emphasis made by the head coach. Nick Saban coaches special teams at Alabama. Frank Beamer. Noted for great special teams play. The head coaches that emphasize special teams and not just lip service, but actually back it up. They put starters on special teams. They spend uh, quality time in practice uh, going over special teams. Those are the teams that excel in special teams. Yeah, Urban Meyer. You know, he's Urban a guy Meyer, that definitely. Example, that's right. You know, it's all the great. A lot of the great coaches do and. And you're right. You look back at the national championship game this past year, you know, Clemson has a better than average chance of, of winning that football game were it not for special teams. And the, the kicking game in particular, kick return, kick coverage, that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, special teams allowed Alabama to win the national championship this past year, so they're very important. Um, you know, another thing I noticed uh, when he was talking today, uh, you know, I, I don't think they quite know – who the quarterback is going to be right now. And I've heard the same kind of internally, uh, but it looks like, you know, from what he said about Perry Orth, you know, he praised him. He was complimentary. And, and I've heard Orth's had a great summer and he's really taken on a leadership role and Muschamp praised him for that, but then came back and said, you know, we're going to play whoever can help us win. And, and Perry understands that. So, so what did you make of that comment? And, and is, is that kind of telling us, that it's going to be Michael Wayne or Bentley, and that you know that's kind of what they're looking at moving forward. Sure. Well, I think we you know we talked about it uh, in a previous podcast about the quarterback position, and I think most champs, you know, he's saying we appreciate everything Perry's done for the program. We appreciate his leadership, but at the end of the day, we're going to play who gives us the best chance to win football games, and. That's just the way it has to be at every position. The best players are going to play, and that's what he said. And, you know, I just think the cream rises to the top, and I expect one of those two talented freshmen to be the quarterback uh, sooner rather than later. Yeah, and I'm not saying Perry Orth can't have the best, you know, August and, and win the job. I mean, that, that's uh, – I'm not ruling him out, but – I don't think you're going to see a situation where, you know, if Orth isn't clearly the best, that they're going to just go with him because of seniority or something like that. Uh, I think it's clearly going to be um, a situation where whoever's the best plays. And I'll say this, too, from the dissecting the press conference today, I think Lorenzo Nunez is already the Brandon Connett role that we've talked about. If you look back at, at Duke in 2013 – you know, they, they had a quarterback that started, the kid from Charlotte, and then they had a kid named Brandon Connett, who actually is a – his parents were South Carolina alums, or one of his parents went to South Carolina. The Gamecocks actually recruited him under Spurrier but didn't want him, didn't offer him. So he ended up going to Duke, and he ended up being the red zone quarterback for them. And, and it was a little more involved than I expect Nunez to be, but he threw for 1,200 yards, rushed for like 850, had 27 touch, or 29 touchdowns. Um, as a red zone quarterback for Duke. 
I think that Nunez is going to be that guy. I think that that's penciled in. I think that's a done deal. Now, how much they use him in that type of situation or if they have a McIlwain and type of quarterback rotation, do they just throw McIlwain out there? You know, that remains to be seen. But right now, I think Kurt Roper sees Nunez as that guy that can be that red zone quarterback, that can come in and run, you know, the the wildcat type of situation, the packages. And I also think that the guy's going to be a heck of a wide receiver. You know, you give him about two weeks to get used to the position, uh, maybe one or two scrimmages, and I think Lorenzo Nunez is going to make some things happen. Yeah, I think the biggest key for Nunez is getting off to a good start and getting some confidence early. I think that's the big key with – a lot of these young receivers, and you know, I've, you know, Pharaoh Cooper, I think, only caught about six balls as a freshman, and then just erupted as a sophomore and junior. But when he was a freshman, about the only pass they threw him the first few games was up. Well, just let's throw it deep to Pharaoh. Let's yeah. just throw it up, and you know, that's not the most high percentage pass to begin with, and I think. Kurt Roper understands that, and I think you're going to see some nice, short, crisp uh, passing game early with these young receivers to get them some touches and get their confidence up. Uh, And I think that's really a good recipe for success on offense. I'm really excited about the big-time potential Nunez brings, not only as a wide receiver, but as a run after the catch player because we all know he is an electric player with the football in his hands. I think he and Jamari Smith both, when you look at those two guys, that, that's definitely what they're going to be able to do best is, you know, make guys miss and do things after the catch. You know, you, you kind of look at what they've done. And, and Jamari, of course, hadn't – I don't think he's played a whole lot since uh, – 2013 in the Coastal Carolina game where he rushed for over 100 yards and looked very elusive doing it. But he looked like he could make some guys miss in the spring game. Um, it, it, that's what he's best at, being elusive. I, I think Nunez is somewhat elusive. I think he's also a guy that's big and can run physically. Um, so, so you start to combine those two guys, you know, with the Debo Samuel and then Brian Edwards, the freshman who really came on in the spring, you know, there, there's all of a sudden hope for that, that spot. You know, you, you look at it and, you know, right now it's Debo and nobody else has done anything. But but there's potential there across the board. I'm not saying they're going to light it up. Still think they need to go recruit as many good receivers as they can. But uh, it, it looks like that they, they could have a passing game this year that's maybe not as limited as we thought. I mean, you know, you and I have had conversations where we're like, do you just leave Nunez at quarterback and, and just run the daggum – you know, West Virginia spread option, you know, to move the ball um, this year. But I think that when you look at it, it, it looks like that they're going to have some guys. Yeah, I agree. Another guy I'm excited about is Corey Banks. I think he's a guy that could be a deep threat. And, uh, you know, again, when you start adding guys into the equation with Debo and Brian Edwards, Jamari Smith, Corey Banks, potentially Evan Henson. Um, and then Nunez. And Lorenzo Nunez. I mean, those are some guys. And then, you know, I'm not counting out a Terry Googer. He's a young guy. He's got potential. I want to see what Brian McClendon can do with him. And then, you know, I'm anxious to see uh, Chavis Dawkins out of Burns, who – as we know, comes from a very advanced offensive uh, system and an advanced route runner. You know, I'm I'm excited about that guy. I know he's kind of under the radar, but he's a six-two, two hundred pound guy that can run a legit four-five and has good hands and can run routes. And so it's going to be interesting to see how this shakes out at the wide receiver position. Definitely, and then Kill Pollard as well, six foot, two hundred and thirty pounds, kind of a bigger, freakier type of guy. Um, you know, there are not many two hundred and thirty pound receivers out there, but just like at Burns, you know, Colquitt County is a, is a school that you're going to learn how to run routes and you're going to learn how to play in a passing offense uh, and all that. Um, so yeah, so you look at that—the receivers, Nunez, uh, all that. I think on defense. 
Um, you know, Muschamp again mentioned Jamarcus King. Uh, you know, gave an injury report. Looks like Stephon Taylor maybe a little limited early um, as far as a freshman goes. Um, didn't really say a whole lot about the defense. Um, you know, we spoke to Dante Sawyer earlier today, and uh, he seemed confident. Bryce Allen Williams seemed confident. J- Jonathan Walton seemed really confident um, just in talking to different guys. Uh, but, you know, the, the key for the defense to me, Keith, is to – establish, you know, they need to find out who's going to play and who who's not going to play as far as – and I'm not saying who's going to play as far as the depth chart. Who's going to be a player? You know, is Dante Sawyer going to take that next step? We know he's capable. Is he going to take the next step? What are they going to get out of Jordan Diggs? Are they going to get anything out of Shamik Blackshear? Is Lorenz Bryant a guy that can help the team this year? Or, or is he just a, a guy that can play special teams that they need to coach up Savon, you know, Sherrod Pittman and, and get get him replaced? You know, those are the questions I have, you know, outside of the secondary on the defense with the front seven. And then the secondary is a different story. But, you know, I wanted to get your take on keys for the front seven heading into preseason. I think it's going to be discovering who are going to be the true – your true pass rushers and who are going to be the, the true down and dirty dogs inside. I um, you know, was encouraged that Muschamp said they're going to play Shamik Blackshear at Buck. And that tells me he's really that freak athlete we thought at 6'4", 265 pounds to have a chance to, to play the Buck position. Yes. And uh, Dante Sawyer, I saw him at the Army All-America game. I think he had four sacks in that game. He was just a beast the entire week. Uh, Chris Lamonds is a guy I'm looking forward to seeing how that's going to shake out, if he's going to be a free safety or if he's going to be a corner or a nickel. Um, you know, Bryson Allen Williams, is he going to be a wheel linebacker? Is he going to be, you know, how much movement is he going to see? I know Muschamp said they wanted to, wanted to simplify with him so he could just go play and not be thinking a lot. So how many different positions is he going to play and where is he going to settle in? Because I think he's really going to be a difference maker at the linebacker position. And, uh, you know, I'm also looking forward to seeing, you know, Kelsey Griffin, Yurick Jones, those guys, and then to see how Lance Thompson brings those younger guys along talking about a boozy Whitlow and a black shear and a Keir Thomas and a Kobe Smith there on the inside. So it's going to be, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, who are, who is going to stand up and man up and actually, you know, declare, Hey, this, you know, this is my spot. Yeah. It, 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 there's going to be good competition, I think, because of the numbers. Um, in, on the front, and, and I think at linebacker, there's some guys that can push. You know, I, I think a guy like T.J. Brunson may be a wild card to play this year, uh, you know, coming in at linebacker. I also think that the secondary is the opposite. They're looking for some guys to step up to play. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and that's the unfortunate thing. Uh, you know, Steven Montak, I think, is going to come in. Pretty soon, I think they're just waiting on transcripts. There was a mistake. They put him on the roster. He shouldn't be on the roster yet. But from what I hear today, they're planning on him being there. Junior college guy. Um, I, you know, not J.C. Jackson, uh, but certainly a guy I think can come in and help in the two deep. You know, you got Chaz Elder, uh, who Muschamp praised in, in the spring, surprisingly enough. Uh, you've got Rashad Fenton and Chris Lamonds. And those are the three he said he's comfortable with. Now, they're going to play with five, you know, five defensive backs in this defense. A lot of nickel this year looking at the offenses that they face. And, you know, so the other two, that, that's going to be critical. Now, we got Jamarcus King, who he mentioned uh, during the press conference, the Juco corner that can come in and play some. Rico McWilliams played a lot last year and mentioned Montac. You know, how is it going to play out? Jordan Diggs is another guy, you know, that, was, that was injured during the spring. D.J. Smith's a player that Muschamp mentioned today, said he needed to be more consistent. So how, how is this going to shake out in the secondary? Well, I think that's really the $64,000 question. I don't even think uh, Travaris Robinson and Will Muschamp know the answer yet. It's going to be determined over the next 30 days of fall camp. 
And I think the safety position is where they really need guys to step up. I think if you could play with Fenton and LeMans and King and Rico McWilliams all at corner and use other guys at the safety position, I think that gives you the best chance. Every one of those guys that has to play nickel, that has to play safety, to me, that's a sign that you just don't have guys at safety. That's why it's essential that Jordan Diggs, uh, Chaz Elder, and D.J. Smith step up their game in fall camp and really live up to their billings. I mean, you're talking about four-star guys, Chaz Elder, D.J. Smith, uh, Jordan Diggs, Army All-American, Chaz Elder, under Armour, All-American, D.J. Smith. You know, Ryan Bartow held him as potentially the best defensive back in that class in the state of Georgia that was littered with, you know, big-time four-star guys. These guys have to step up uh, to really help South Carolina secondary this fall, in my opinion. Yeah, I think I think that's definitely something that has to happen. You know, and, and Smith has had some some nice moments. Elder had some nice moments early in his career. I think the the asinine idea of playing him at corner um, was 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 bad early on. Uh, you know, I a think little less than brilliant. When they when they, when they when they finally put him at safety in 2013 out at Arkansas, I thought, man, the kid looked pretty good. Then he got a concussion. Then lo and behold, last year they switch him back to corner for some reason. I mean, I'm like, I don't, I don't. It didn't really matter who you put back there. You were still 12 yards off the ball, and in the sport of American college football, a first down is 10 yards. And uh, everybody, including Grayson Lambert and and Brian Schottenheimer, over and over again knew that last year. Um, you know, so finally, maybe getting back home uh, at safety and and maybe having just a new staff, you know, probably helps Elder. A little bit. I mean, the kid's six foot two. He's two hundred and five pounds. He can run. He's always been a great athlete. Um, you know, we were here and we didn't know if he was going to make it with the new staff at all. <laughs> you know, we we thought this guy, you know, a new staff with more discipline, new strength program. You know, that challenged and him. He may have been Georgia Southern bound. <laughs> yeah, he uh, he was challenged uh, as a player by the new staff. But what encourages me from a South Carolina perspective is, you know, it's not like this guy got challenged and then we look at the spring and we're like, you know, he's buried on the depth chart. He's maybe a special teams guy. You know, they're looking for answers. He answered the challenge and became one of the three guys that publicly Will Muschamp, who coaches the safeties, said he was comfortable with. So how about that? I mean, there's a guy, in my opinion, and, and, you know, you got to go do it in the games and you got to do it over the course of a season – and it's just practice we're talking about. But here's a guy that was challenged that came through and got to where he needed to be, at least from a practice standpoint. Don't you think? No, I agree. I think there's no doubt he was challenged and challenged uh, frequently in the off season, and he, and he rose to the occasion. So, you know, let's see. Some guys, you know, they need, you know, uh, to turn the other page. They need, you know, a fresh start. And he's got that opportunity this year, as does a lot of seniors on this football team, uh, particularly on defense, to step up and have a big senior year with a new coaching staff who, you know, again, J.C., over and over, talking to a good friend of mine today, just really – touting Will Muschamp staff and when I started rattling off names I was like you know it's harder to find a better defensive staff it's hard to find a better recruiting staff in the Southeastern Conference of what Will Muschamp's put together and I'm and I'm including him on that defensive staff because he is the safeties coach mm-hmm. yeah that, so that, that, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting and uh, it's really going to be key is you know, some seniors like Kelsey Griffin, like uh, Jonathan Walton, and guys like Chaz Elder. Those guys at all three levels of the defense as seniors 
are they going to answer the call? Are they going to step up and be playmakers for this defense? Yeah, it's absolutely true. I mean, that they need some guys. And those are more question marks. I mean, there's a slew of, of question marks. I mean, you could you could honestly sit down and play Monopoly, and, you know, there's chance. They call it chance. The, the, I guess the orange cards or the red cards. Um, and you draw those if you land on chance, and there's usually a full deck of them. You know, you could literally write a question about this Carolina football team on just about every one of those cards in the deck and pull it out, and they're legit questions. <laughs> so, so that's, well, this, this team has more question marks than the Riddler's costumes. <laughs> that's absolutely the truth. So I, I, uh, I, I agree with you there. But the, the thing is, though, is that it's, they're not without answers. You know, I mean, you look at the 1999 team, and, and I've heard some people out there say, oh, it's just like 99. Well, well South Carolina went 0-11 in 99, and – in some games, they struggled to cross the 50. Um, you know, so I, I just – I don't see it ending up like that or even being close to that. But that 99 team had a few guys uh, that could make some things happen, and, and then injuries hit them, and that was it. You know, and, and I'm not saying this team could survive catastrophic injuries. You know, certainly nothing like Florida had in 2013 when Muschamp was there. Um, but, it, but it's not like they're without, ant, without anybody you know, that can come in and play. I mean, you know, it's it's a situation where maybe there isn't the hyped, like, running back recruit like Derek Watson in 99 where everybody's like, oh, he can come in and rush for 1,000 yards and do this and that and the other and save everybody. You know, that guy's probably Brandon McIlwain in this class and Brian Edwards. They're probably the top two guys in the 2016 class or the, or the ones you'll hear the most about. But But this isn't a team that, you know – you look and, you know, you have two or three injuries and you're playing walk-ons. You know, you're trotting Kevin Sides out there or Mikhail Goodman or guys that aren't ready. You know, I, I just don't – I think that with the way the lines of scrimmage are, you know, this team will still be able to compete. Now, what, how, what, if that turns into wins or not, I, I don't know. And, and I, the reason I'm saying this is because we talk about all the questions and on some South Carolina teams in the – distant past that weren't very good, there were not a lot of potential answers. There, it wasn't a situation where, you know, if this guy doesn't step up, you know, then we have this guy we can go to, or maybe you look at this guy or you switch this around. It was, if this guy doesn't step up, it's going to cost us our season. <laughs> you know, if this guy does not play well, that's it. You know, and, and I just don't see it being that way right now. Uh, and, and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's a situation where there's just not anybody – um, but to me, it seems like there's a lot of guys kind of on that needs to step up footing, uh, and there's enough guys to where they can piece it together. Well, that's the hope. And, I mean, certainly there are players. There are some talented players that are on that roster, and there's some guys, quite frankly, that need to live up to their billing. And, uh, you know, I, I just don't think it's a free ride down there now. Everything's earned. And they've had a very challenging off season, and this team does have a lot of question marks. But there are talented guys down there. It's just going to be can the coaching staff piece this together? Will Lady Luck be on their side with the injury bug and having minimal injuries this year at key positions, and you know that all important quarterback position coming through. Absolutely. Uh, for the Gamecocks. I mean, let's face it, J.C., this has got to be a September to remember for the Gamecocks. Three conference games all on the road, one non-conference opponent, East Carolina at home. For South Carolina to get to six, seven wins, they've got to come out of September with a three and one record, don't you think? I, I think it's it's pretty – important to do that because you know you, you look at the schedule and and look it the schedule says this when and we all look at everybody's schedule at the beginning of the year and we count up wins and losses and South Carolina is no different but whenever we look at the schedule you know we look and we say how can South Carolina get to six wins because that's legitimate this year you know I think some some people out there that that have read all the the post or the preseason coverage offseason coverage on the big spur you know if you're looking at it from like a Georgia fan's perspective 
and and you just fired a 10 win coach because the next guy you bring in you want him to win 12 and be Alabama then you're going to read the big spur and you're going to think we're absolutely insane because we're breaking it down and analyzing it and pointing out positives and saying this could happen but, but we're saying it in terms of how can South Carolina get back to 6 and 6 or better because that's realistically with where the program was at at the end of the spur era from a talent standpoint where honestly you know, a very good source right before they went to play Missouri said, or right before they went to play LSU, looked at the roster, broke it down, not counting the snappers and kickers who were all SEC level. There were 31 guys on the travel roster that even had a chance to play, that in his opinion had a chance to be in the SEC. Not, you know, not starters, not elite guys in the SEC, but had a chance to play in the SEC. You know, that that's tough on a roster where you're traveling, you know, 55 and you have 85. I mean, that, that that's rough. So, so you're looking at it in terms of six and six, and you look at the schedule and you say, okay, if, say, if South Carolina can beat Vanderbilt, Kentucky, East Carolina, Western Carolina, UMass, and Missouri, and the Missouri games at home – then they can go to a bowl. That's six wins. <laughs> and, and and that doesn't sound like a monumental task for any college football team, quite frankly. Um, and Vanderbilt and Kentucky are two of the first four games of the season, and both are on the road. So if you can win those and you beat East Carolina and you come out three and one, you're halfway there. You know, you're halfway there. Western Carolina and UMass um, – Neither one of those teams run the triple option, so I'm pretty sure they'll escape a Citadel-like game <laughs> this year where they get caught up. I mean, if they're playing Wofford, then you don't necessarily, you know, chalk that up. But um, I, I think that, you know, they'll beat those two teams. So then, okay, so you either beat Missouri at home. If you stump your toe there, you got to upset somebody. But, hey, Texas A&M's at home. Georgia's at home. Tennessee's at home. You know, those are all games at williams Bryce Stadium. So, so yeah, I, I think that, you know, when you're looking at it from the standpoint of who should they beat, who could they beat to get to six and six and go to a bowl, then three and one in September is, is pretty paramount. And if they can still one at Mississippi State, then they're four and oh, and uh, you're two thirds of the way there. Absolutely. So. I mean, that's, that's the thing is, you know, every year it seems like, Pretty much the media is wrong, and yeah. you never you never know how a season's going to go eight weeks into the season, seven weeks into the season with injuries. I mean, nobody can predict. You know, even a couple of years ago, Georgia had one of those seasons where they were just crippled by injuries, and uh, you know their season went south. And so, and we all know Florida was just obliterated by injuries under Muschamp that one year. And, you know, they were they were coming off an 11-win season. Yeah, uh, started 4-0 and, and, and lost seven straight. Yes. Or 4-1 and one has lost seven straight, <laughs> including one to Georgia Southern. So that was, that was brutal. Well, big news on the recruiting trail today. And, um, you know, South Carolina got T.J. Moore. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and tell you that Talking to sources close to the Tennessee program, the Vols thought they had him. They were supremely confident he was heading to Tennessee. South Carolina, while they felt like they were right there, was not as supremely confident. And lo and behold, the kid goes out and and picks the Gamecocks. Uh, And he had silently committed to the Gamecocks during his visit. We we try not to report on silent commits anymore because, you know, they don't hold a lot of the time – and if you come back and say it, he's silently committed, and then the kid picks somebody else, you know, you got a lot of potential for fans to attack on Twitter. But I, I thought this was huge, Keith. Number one, T.J. Moore's a guy they've recruited for over a year. They were one of the first offers that he got when he camped at South Carolina I last think summer. His first, his first yeah. offer. I think NC State came in maybe right around that time, but it was definitely, definitely he was a guy that Sean Elliott personally evaluated and wanted for over a year. He's in Charlotte at Mallard Creek High School, which is a very important high school for South Carolina to recruit. It's, you know, they have guys every single year, multiple prospects. It's in Charlotte where the Gamecocks are trying to make inroads. And number three, you know, Tennessee is they've built their roster back 
and Butch Jones has been there for a while. Every year they establish more and more momentum in the state of North Carolina. And we all remember Philip Fulmer had a good run in North Carolina when he was there. That went away with Kiffin and then Dooley, uh, and it's come back a bit with Jones. If you're South Carolina, you do not want the Vols to start beating you consistently in North Carolina on players because they're already doing so in Atlanta to a certain extent. And if they start getting North Carolina, then all of a sudden you're sort of surrounded. Um, you know, that then South Carolina is next where they're going to come try and pick off players. So if you're South Carolina, this was a big recruiting win for a number of reasons, uh, not, notwithstanding that, you know, they beat an SEC East rival who definitely is continuing to try to make serious inroads in a very important state for South Carolina. Yeah, I got to give uh, props to Sean Elliott. I, I thought when I read yesterday the kid did make the visit to Tennessee, I thought, well, here we go. You know, we, we talked about more previously that every time he comes to South Carolina, he's on the verge of committing, and then he goes back home, and then it dies down, and he just doesn't pull the trigger. But today, you know, on the, on the eve of fall camp, he pulls the trigger, and is a big time guy. I mean, this guy is six six, two hundred and eighty five, two hundred and ninety pounds, long arms, very athletic, just a very uh, physically imposing, uh, impressive athletic prospect at the offensive tackle position. And you know, beating Tennessee and beating the North Carolinas and NC States, it's a uh, it's a big get because. We've talked in the past, Charlotte is, you know, an hour and change from campus. It's closer to the University of South Carolina than any Atlantic Coast Conference school or any SEC school. You know, University of South Carolina is the closest major college to that Charlotte area, and that's an area South Carolina really needs to dominate. Um in my opinion, and that that was a really good get today, um, getting T.J. Moore to go along with Eric Douglas' teammate. So it's very, very big news for Sean Elliott, very big news for the Gamecocks. Definitely, and, and going and a pretty good class from North Carolina sort of coming together now, you know, with, with Douglas and Moore. Uh, you know, Sherrod Green out of Rocky Mount, I think, is an under-the-radar linebacker guy that, you know, I, I think is going to be very good, probably will outplay his, you know, mid- to high three-star ranking. Uh, and then Jalen Dickerson's the same way. Uh, here, here's a guy that would have a lot of offers, you know, had his early grades been okay, but who came to camp and, you know, was very good. So, you know, you got the two guys out of the pipeline, big time school, and, and Douglas and, and Moore, and hopefully that helps you get more guys in the future for Mallard Creek. Um, and Mallard Creek also, keep in mind, that's a place where Will Muschamp went and got DJ Humphreys when uh, DJ Humphreys was um, a high school recruit, you know, that was a first round pick at the University of Florida. So he has some connections there. Bobby Bentley works the school, Travaris Robinson's worked the school a little bit. And then, of course, Sean Elliott with Moore. You know, so you have the two guys from the, the pipeline school. Then you have a guy from Southern Pines and a guy from Rocky Mount. So you're hitting that eastern area where there's a lot of sleepers. Uh, you know, Matthew Butler from Garner, North Carolina, I think would be the next guy on commit watch from the Tar Hill State for the Gamecocks. And so, you know, you're putting together a nice little class uh, from North Carolina, which I think will continue to be a big, big state for South Carolina. No doubt is uh, over the weekend, 2018 five-star running back uh, from Scotland County was on campus. Could be the number one running back in the country for the next class. And, you know, he's a guy, you know, you got Jay Wooten, you got Travian Robertson, uh, you got Byron McKnight from that school. Uh, and that, uh, I think, Isaac, uh, Highway 74 corridor over there in yeah. eastern North Carolina, uh, right across the state line from Sherall. And, uh, you know, again, a kid, the uh, early word is that want to travel too far away from home. Well, hey, here's the Gamecocks, you know, just a couple hours away. And uh, certainly a big need, you know, for 
for a big time playmaker at the running back position. So, you know, the Tar Heel State's going to continue to be, I think, a major emphasis for Will Muschamp staff, treating it basically like an as an in state uh, territories in North Carolina, really hitting it hard. And I think a state that could really pay dividends down the road uh, as Will Muschamp builds his football program. I agree with you completely. There's Amir White. Had an excellent visit from what I am told. Uh, Gamecocks feel like they're right there with Georgia and North Carolina. It's way early, uh, but they're laying groundwork uh, for him uh, to be a major factor. And certainly, um, you know, he would be a game changer. Well, that's all the time we have for today here on the Locked on the Gamecocks podcast. Keith, great to be with you again, man. And uh, certainly we look forward to continuing to do this as the season rolls on. And we'll see what ultimately happens this week in practice and then uh, talk all about it next week. All right, JC. Looking forward to it. All right. See you, man. Yep.